We got the Bankers Helping Bankers Fund guys today. I'm so excited about this. This is something that we've all talked about and thought about uh, for a long time. Please introduce yourself. Tell us about the fund. Dave, super excited to be here. Uh, we've, as you said, been thinking about this for a long time, so I'm glad we finally pulled it off. I'm going to jump in and do an introduction of myself real quickly before Rich, because Rich has, as we all know, three major chapters of his life that can take a long time. Uh, I, I have, I think, one chapter, uh, and that chapter is that- A long I chapter, enjoy, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I enjoy working with early stage companies. I enjoy fintech. I'm really excited that we've ended up in partnership with Bankers Helping Bankers to create a fund that's helping community banks get ready for the next stage of their evolution. And at the same time, we get to work with some really cool companies that are helping those banks. And in the mix, both the banks that are investing in our fund and we ourselves get to make money for everybody. So it's, it's a real win-win-win venture fund. And that's why I'm excited to be here. Rich, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, um, I'm super excited as well. Um, one of the great things that has happened to Niraj and I, I think, is the opportunity to get to know uh, you, you both, get to know uh, the folks at IBAT, um, and it's just been incredible. And, um, you know, Niraj and I have, have had careers that have spanned finance, um, both from an investing side and investment banking side, equity research side. And then we've also had operational experience uh, running companies. Um, me as a CEO, Niraj as a CFO. And I think the thing we've learned over the years that is you know, pretty obvious is it, it's all about who you work with and who you wake up every day and get to work with. And so for us, as we got in, in thinking about this next thing that we wanted to do, one, being able to do it together and do something that we're passionate about, which is investing in early stage companies and helping nurture them and watch them grow and develop. And then two, doing it um, in a sector that matters so much to our um, global, I mean, our national economy um, that we've also experienced directly uh, the relationship we have with community banks in our own lives. And then three, being able to do it with a group of partners that just, you know, kind of enrich every day and, and uh, not only from a, a quality of information sharing, but also just in terms of good human beings. It's, it's kind of a dream come true for us. We from the FedFiz data side have worked a ton with lots of accelerators, incubators. Obviously that leads you into the funding and VC world, right? And kind of watching how all those pieces operate. And it's been a whole, I think, right? So you've got maybe some, some rock stars that are either funding folks or rock stars on accelerators and incubators, but they're not necessarily community bank specific or FinTech technology specific, right? And so you have these holes that pop up in just about everywhere you go. And I think that's what really initially got us all so excited and engaged. I mean, if you think about Williston, you guys, us, just that little group right there, that's a, kind of the three different parts, right? We do a lot on the technology side. You guys understand the all the finance and the funding that I certainly don't, right? And then Christopher, uh, who understands and believes in community banks more than him, right? And then as that group and team has been built out, having folks like Jay Wood Forest is just incredible, right? The insight that he brings. But I think what's most important too is uh, in the broader Baker Shopping Bankers ecosystem, we've got some really cool sponsors uh, that are interesting and very important parts of sort of the distribution network, right? So as you look at banking products and all of the interoperability and APIs and everything that has to be connected, right? And I need 47 connections to get a product to market and installed that has to work as an ecosystem with all the partners. And that's really what I think gets brought together. Fantastic. Cause that has been what I think is the missing link in all of this, you know, investing money in a company that you don't have any idea how the hell they're supposed to get to market or could even help them get to market. Right. And the idea is that, Hey, we'll go back to the investors and force it down their throat. That doesn't work. <laughs> uh, and then of course you've got this who can play and who can not play. And, and near if you'd kind of address that a little bit about what I think is so cool here is everybody can participate. You know, it is community bank basically centric, but there's no walls and rules around who can play. Yeah, no, that, that's that's exactly right. Before I address that, uh, Dave, I, I just want to do one other thing, which is uh, you guys brought up the Monday meetings we have. You know, <laughs> honestly, those are my favorite meetings at this point. Um, I think it's really unique what our fund has created with that group. I can't think of any other group 
that has this 360 degree view of what's happening in banks, technology, finance, all of us putting our thoughts together, our heads together, and coming up with the right answers to help community banks in terms of which companies we want to fund, how we want to help those companies grow within the bank. So uh, I just, uh, you brought it up and I just wanted to uh, kind of reiterate how cool that is, how critical it's become, and how personally I look forward to having that meeting. So your, your thought about how anybody can participate. So I think that's true on a couple of levels. One is obviously on the bank side, right? We've opened this up to community banks throughout the country. So it's not just Texas specific. It's not just bankers helping bankers specific. The branding is all bankers helping bankers because that's what we're about, right? That's what we're doing is we're helping banks. So from the investment side, uh, it's a very open group that's bringing in partners from all over the country. We're in good conversations in every part of the country. On the investment side, as we look at portfolio companies, same deal, Dave, it's wide open. We're looking at companies that are in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're looking at companies here in our backyard in DC. We've already obviously invested in a company in Texas, one in Colorado, but it's a wide open. We're gonna look at anything that helps community banks. We're gonna put all of our weight and muscle behind it and we're gonna deliver for community banks. Perfect, yep. Well, nobody's really tried to do anything. You know, community banks, I mean, I think a lot of people wrote them off. I really do. And mm -hmm. uh, I think they still do. And I think there's a lot of fight left in them. And uh, you found the salmon at the tip of the stream here that uh, these, these are fighters and they're looking for opportunities and they're looking for great ways to help. Again, the whole idea of bankers helping bankers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I love it. So let's kind of unlock this thing a little bit. I want Rich to talk about like the financial aspects of this stuff. How do we go about when we're sitting on this side of the table talking to a founder and deciding who we want to invest in and how do we determine what's the distribution of that market and how do we determine what the funding and levels and all that? Rich, you guys really kind of spearhead the financial side. Yeah, I think I think there's a few different dimensions um, that that we look at, and it's a really good question. I think it always starts when we think about what. Let, let's talk a little bit about the stage of company that we're looking at first of all. So we're looking at uh, because the, in, in venture investing there are many stages of evolution. So we're we're typically looking at companies that are it, what's known as the Series A stage. So they're they've kind of demonstrated some product market fit. They've got some revenue. They've got referenceable clients or products in the market. But they need capital to help accelerate that growth um, and they want strategic capital. It's not just about capital itself. It's about how can we help them uh, be more efficient in their go to market and that sort of thing. So Series A is important because we can add a lot of value, but it's not as risky as some earlier stage type of investing. Um, and then we're always looking at business model first, right? So we like, uh, you know, SaaS, fast type of business models where you have recurring revenues, you have high switching costs. Uh, which gives you a competitive moat um, and you have good visibility because you you kind of know what your revenues are. You have good visibility in your revenue so you can manage your expenses accordingly. And then as you get scale, you get scale economics and you get really expanding margins. Um, and so we like that a lot. And then so that, that's a business model. At the end of the day, we're still investing in people and management. And so that's the most important thing. And, and so when we're looking at management, we're really looking at a combination of experience and track record. But also we want uh, coachability. We want it to be a two-way relationship. We don't want management teams that are uh, not willing to kind of think of us as strategic partners um, because we can add so much value, especially when we think about some of the areas at Series A that you need help with, especially around go-to-market. So think about just a classic go-to-market strategy. Um, with the data that uh, that you have at FedFiz um, and the ecosystem that we build, and as we increasingly add more LPs, we can help our our uh, portfolio companies uh, target the right right banks at the right time with the right technology that's going to work, right? And that's going to be as frictionless as possible. Because one thing we know is that uh, we can't create a friction filled sale. We want it to be as easy as possible for the bank. Most community banks don't have um, super large development teams and they, they want to be very protective of the resources and how they allocate resources. So the more uh, easy it is to integrate the technology, get it up and running and on board and minimize change management so that the bank can see immediate benefit, 
the better it is. And that's where I think we can be very helpful when we're looking at companies and then when we make an investment in helping steer them to the right uh, opportunities at the right time so that they're not just throwing spaghetti against the wall. Here's here's one for you, Dave, spaghetti against the wall, see if it sticks kind of thing. So, um, how, do you, how do you go about, you know, kind of share with people a little bit like when we talk about distribution. Yep. Uh, it, it's more than just an investment. Yeah. So, I mean, strategic money, right? And I think a lot of what Rich was saying was spot on. I, to the point, though, I don't know if bankers really fully grasp or understand that just like in community banking, think about sort of the association network and politics, right? And the engagement level with various state and national level associations. That same sort of ecosystem does exist in vendor and fintech world, right? And so as you'd imagine, there's competing organizations and there's people that are, you know, in management and different things and volunteers. And so there's definitely people, to Rich's point, the, the people first idea, there's people that have a very good reputation right, that have are good stewards and helpers throughout the industry, certainly more visible to the technology crowd, right. but also that same reputation in banks. I think that was hugely important and well stated. Uh, the other thing I'd mentioned on distribution, there's almost always, I mean, look, unless somebody's building a core, right, you're probably going to need to to hit a core API and connect. Same thing if you look at digital banking, uh, think about all the parts and pieces that go into something like loan origination, right? right? All the third party interactions. And so that sort of ecosystem and connectivity conversation is important. And so what we can see is a, the data to help them identify a target market, but also partners that need to be integrated. And that's something that's been really cool with bankers helping bankers. There's so many really just great supportive community banking companies. We got three of the top five cores, a uh, number of the, you know, other folks think about Discover Pulse is a great example, right? Yeah, every, 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 uh, on and on. So some of the larger platforms that are big time supporters and lots of others that kind of create their own ecosystem. And so that becomes a really friendly point of entry right. for our companies uh, to make those introductions and get everybody connected. And I think, you know, to Rich's point for me, while there's all this data and all this connectivity and, and technology integration, it's still really about the people. Right. And getting everybody hooked up. Uh, once everybody does a little checking up on each other and finds that somebody's got a history of being good people, it's, it's a big difference maker. Now, the, the, the one thing I just if I could just jump in that I think is really important, too, from our from our funds mm -hmm. perspective, and this might be different than other fintech funds that are out there. We, we've sort of all kind of joined hands and said that, you know, the, the one dogmatic rule that we'll have about investing is that we will only invest in companies that are there to help benefit community banks. We are not investing in companies that are trying to disintermediate or someday, you know, kind of take the community bank out of the picture. And I think that's a huge differentiator uh, for us. And I think when we when we when we explain that to companies, it sort of self-selects certain types of companies out. And when we and we explain it to community banks, it gives them a lot of comfort and trust that we're not sort of uh, trying to to invest in companies that ultimately might you know, step on the backs of the community bank to achieve their end goal. We're really careful about that. And I think that's a really important uh, trust thing that has to be built with the management teams and our investors, uh, the, the banks themselves. Well, it's an important evolution in the market right now. And Niraj, I'd like to flip it to you on this one. So I think we could all agree a, uh, you know, a, a Pfizer, a CSI, a DCI, right? Uh, very traditional, very community bank focused, not a hard thing to identify versus a, uh, you know, something that like we all know that a chime is definitely competitive, right? Mm -hmm. But there is this emerging middle thing that is really hard to describe. It's it's kind of like mud, you know, and it's like they they definitely have a bit more of a direct to consumer feel, right? And they also have they see banks as a possible distribution channel to get to those consumers. And they are likely, you know, in an interesting position where they're willing to be supportive and community bank focused if they had the support from all of our communities to welcome them into community banking. Yep. But likely, if they don't get that support and that entry into our economy, they're going to do their best to go out and compete all of us. And so I feel this weird, it's like a stewardship thing, right? At the same time, it's a it, it's just a bit of a gray line, Neeraj. You want to talk some about that? I mean, you've seen a lot of this. Yeah, Tanner, really good point. Um, uh, I'm going to do the same thing I did with Dave. Before I jump into answer your question, I'm going to just add a little comment to what Rich was talking about, which is his comment about how we're not investing in companies that are trying to disintermediate community banks. 
there's a real passionate reason for that. It's not just something we made up. So both Rich and I have small businesses independent of each other. We learned the hard way when COVID hit and when PPP happened, how you could be a 20 year customer of a very large bank. <clears throat> I won't take any names, but um, if Come you on. think of our- <laughs> Throw it, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bank of America, All twist right. my arm. Yeah, right. Just one example, but I know we can give you lots more. So we were, we were customers of Bank of America for gosh, two plus decades with our small business. And when COVID happened and when the PPP loan started happening, uh, you know, that, that 800 number that I had for Bank of America got me exactly nothing, right? I couldn't get a hold of a human to talk to. And it's because, as we all know now, the big banks were incentivized to do the big PPP loans, not the little ones. So they put all small businesses at the back of the line. We also know who did step up, community banks, right? And if those community banks had not stepped up, the stress level, the additional risk to small businesses back then were going to be heightened. So there's there's a real reason why Rich and I are committed and passionate about this because yeah. we benefited from our experience with community banks. Go ahead. Rich. Yeah, and I just wanted to just and then you know, I should answer you know, the, the the question, but I just the I just wanted to comment on on this story too because. Niraj banked with Bank of America, and he had to make a switch very quickly to access PPP. In, in the business that I own, I, I established from day one a relationship in the local community with a community bank, and um, and that's been a wonderful relationship. But what was really sp special was during the PPP, it was a phone call, and it was three days later, you know, fill out whatever required paperwork, but three days later, the funds were there. And it, it wasn't as stressful for me as it was for Niraj, who was kind of figuring out how to scramble to do that. And I think that, you know, for me, validated my original intention of why I established the relationship in the with the community bank for the business. Um, it just it just totally validated the power of that relationship and, you know, the fact that I can pick up the phone, I know who the president of the bank is, I walk in the branch, they know who I am. Um, and that's very, very different than the relationship that uh, that I've had in the past with a Citibank or that New Rush has had with the Bank of America. So, yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Rich. We have so, to make so, these community banks improve their technology because they are way behind. I can say that as well. An important, so, an important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now to your question, Tanner. So there's definitively an evolutionary phase between what's happening in the technology companies and the banks. You're 100 percent right. There's more and more gray shades, and I know we've talked about some of these companies at our investment community meeting. I'm not going to take their names. Um, there are companies that stand ready to help community banks better service their clients or add some features and functionality that community banks would take a long time to get to on their own because they don't have the bandwidth. But the other side of that coin is you know, there's a little bit of a danger, right? If these relationships and business partnerships are not handled correctly from day one, some of these companies could turn into competitors in the future. I think where we are today, the smarter technology companies understand what's special about a bank, right? The regulatory issues, the close relationships that these community banks have with their customers. So they get that. Again, these are the smarter technology companies. There are those out there. There are some that think they know it all and you know they'll probably have a different outcome. <laughs> so one of the things that we're trying to do as a fund is, um, and this is, you know, again, uh, kind of blowing our horn a little bit, we're not a typical fund, which is we just look at companies and then we either invest or we don't. We do a lot of value add once we've invested, but even before we've invested, we put some of these companies in touch with banks. There's one that we've put in touch now with multiple banks. We're trying to help that technology company come up with the right business relationship so that it helps the technology company, it helps the bank, because the product that this company brings to the table will actually help the banks. As we all know, with interest rates having spiked, deposits are a little bit riskier for banks 
than they were a year ago, right? Because consumers and businesses want higher yields on those deposits. And if, if you as a bank can't deliver that, there's a, you know, there's, there's, there's a little bit of a risk that that deposit goes away. So if we can help this one company come in, do what they do, help the banks deliver better deposits, but it still stays as the bank's customer, I personally believe that's a win-win-win strategy, and it's a gray shade that we can turn into a win-win-win shade strategy. I think, Tanner, you're 100% right. We're going to see a lot more of these types of situations. Uh, I think, you know, if I'm using words that are uh, uh, popular in the technology world, fast, embedded finance, all of these kinds of things, that's what's happening. Make no mistake, the community bank has a very important role, in my humble opinion. That important role is it serves that community. People can walk into that branch anytime they want to. They can, like Rick just said, pick up the phone and talk to the president. They can't do those things with all of these technology companies. So finding, finding ways to make both of them work jointly together in a win-win situation, that's, that's what we're trying to enable. That's perfect, man. I'll tell you what, yeah. one of the things that we really hardcore around here is, uh, you know, knowing people and their knowledge of the business, knowing repeat offenders is what we call them, people that are, this is their second or third business, you know, that they've gone through. But back to the distribution piece of this thing, I think it's critical. Um, we understand where they're at in their journey. Uh, so as an can, institution. Can I just rip? interrupt the hell out of you real quick and hit on sure. that the repeat offenders concept can everybody just think about this real quick mm -hmm. all right we wake up tomorrow we're like hey let's let's start a, a technology company and we're going to help banks right can you outline out of the thousand possible scenarios how many of those you survive right and you end up in this business again right like it, it you could actually be successful and how you exit that success could mean that you're not going to be a repeat founder so it's very difficult right to have you know, bankers that have bought your products before, right? And gone through that life cycle of that company and you go to another and still have a good reputation amongst the vendors, the bankers, everything. That is a very tall order. It is. Well, and that's why I like them so much is that, that they've gone through the ringer. They understand. And this is what really makes the difference, I think, with, with this particular fund and anything else I've ever been involved with is that we're able to take this stuff understand where you're at in your journey, identify what it takes to get there, see the data side of it, know what connections they have and they don't have so that we can really accelerate and push this out. Yeah. You know, when I talk about it with people, like with my wife, I talk to her about, you know, gosh, I mean, anybody can invest in a 3X company, but you know, how do you get a company that's going to get a tenfold return, right? And, and that right there, how do you get a whole stable of, let's call it premier stallions that want to come to you? But that's how you do it is you, you have the knowledge base, you have the infrastructure necessary, you have the data, the connections, the distribution, as well as the financial expertise that, that Rich, the community bank aspect that Christopher Williston and, and Niraj and those guys all bring together. And we're able to steward this thing in a way that's uniquely different than anything else I've ever seen. Well, can I make a make a point on that? Because I, I think that's a really a really good point. And and um, when we when we first started to kind of craft up this this idea and we all came together, it was our belief that we would have incredible opportunity to source the best companies and that they would, you know, they would they would validate kind of the ecosystem concept that we've built. We we actually haven't aggressively been marketing the fund at all because we're we're in the fundraising stage. But we've had a lot of companies coming uh, through to us, either uh, referral or just hearing about what we were doing. And when we meet with them, and we've had we've had uh, two companies, uh, at least two companies that have closed recent rounds that are willing to reopen the round so that we can invest in them, even though our fund isn't fully funded yet. And I think that's a really good validation of what you've just said. And the reason when you ask them about this, there's kind of three big, big differentiators, because if you assume capital is somewhat of a commodity, um, then what, <laughs> what, what else is there, right? So first of all, there's the uh, domain expertise that, that collectively we all bring, which you were just alluding to, including, uh, you know, using, having a data informed strategy as opposed to just an anecdotal, you know, gut feel based strategy. And I think that's really important. The second is the access to the network that we bring, which is potential customers, potential partnerships that we can make. And also just um, a lot of these tech companies, as you were pointing out, don't necessarily always understand or monitoring how quickly the regulatory landscape is changing. And so, you know, understanding that regulatory is a, is a big part. 
And then the third aspect is the fact that um, it is very rare to have a venture investor, a venture capitalist investor that has actually run companies that have been in the seats of the entrepreneurs that you're investing in and, and, and have sat in the trenches. And, and so I ran three companies. They were all venture backed. None of the none of the venture capital uh, uh, folks that sat on our board had ever run a company. And so they'd come to board meetings and, and they would have interesting things to share. But they didn't understand the complexity of doing something, implementing a strategy or, or you know, shifting, rolling out a new product and that sort of thing. And so the fact that we've done that and we understand that is very different as well. So when you put those three things together, it's incredible, right? Like, And we've heard this um, validated by the companies, and that's why I'm so optimistic. Uh, and at some point, we should talk about why we're optimistic about uh, the, the market backdrop that we're investing in, too, because I think we're at a really unique moment in time where yeah. there's uh, incredible opportunities in front of us um, for to generate outsized returns as well. But I just wanted to make that point. I love how you're so nice about everything, right? It's like they don't necessarily inform. It's like a nice way to say there's a lot of dumbass VC investors out there, right? <laughs> and, and that's the truth. I mean, we all know it. And just, again, just say it. Hey, man, this, this is the difference. And that's why I want to be a part of this is that this is smart people. Right. that know how to execute well i think there's a goodness too uh there's a, an old quote somewhere basically alluding to the fact that you find a lot of people that are sort of self-made they tend to be just the nicest people which really bucks the trend right or the yep. you would think and it's because when they started out they had nothing but their own kindness right and value to the ecosystem and i think you know i mean that certainly represents us right and uh, a lot of us in the community banking space feel that way and feel gratitude Right. And so, I mean, I've seen just with you guys, there's been a number of companies that, uh, you know, who knows in the future, maybe invest in, maybe not. Uh, but just the favors that you guys are doing. Right. And calling in favors and helping out and, and all that. It's uh, being to your point on community banks, being stewards of the industry. Right. And we're really investing in community banking at the end of the day. And I think what we all realize strongly is that technology is the path and the way. Well, right. It's the only way to win. And the community banks today don't have much of an avenue except individually yeah. to really participate and be good partners. But we holistically and with the associations, right, we have a responsibility to, to help folks find their way to helping community banks. It's you a know, good thing. Who was the, the, the entertainer here, the hardest working man in show business? Right? <laughs> That's D-Rod. I don't know how the hell he ever gets any sleep, man. There you go. <laughs> Well, uh, so I think Rich, you brought up a good point. I, I actually want to bring up a related uh, point as well. And Rich, I know you want to talk a little bit about just why now, right? Because of we find ourselves at this interesting juncture where valuations are down. So Rich and I are salivating to put capital to work at these lower valuations. So I'll let Rich talk about that. But I think one of the things I didn't realize when we started this was as big of a deal for community banks as I think it is is the fact that a lot of community banks seem interested in wanting to invest directly into a company, not through a fund, but on their own. And I know there's been some success with that, but I think that's also much higher risk than community bank probably appreciates. Uh, Dave, again, I'm using the kinder, gentler words and, and not the more direct words that uh, you would probably use. And, and the reason for that is, when you invest in these earlier stage companies, even with all of the expertise and network and everything else that we bring to the table, not every one of those companies is going to work out. It's just not because something's going to go wrong with the product, with the company, with the management team or the market. Right. And there will be the some that don't work yeah. out. Yeah. So having a portfolio of 15 to 20 companies, which is what we're doing, we already have two gives you a very good likelihood, just like when you invest in the public markets, right? If you buy one or two stocks, you may wake up one morning and look in the Wall Street Journal and see, oh shit, that company just right. declared bankruptcy, it, right? It yeah. But if you buy a basket of 15 to 20 companies, that one that goes out of business is not gonna hurt you because the other one's gonna more than make up for it. So I think this portfolio approach versus direct investing by what, what we're seeing a lot of banks do is good. The other thing that gets a little bit less press and attention, as venture investors, we know where the market is on valuations. We know what kinds of rights we can get as good 
venture investors. Not, I'm not talking about vulture investing, which is a whole different category. I'm talking about just having some rights, preferred stocks, things that give us some good, good rights as an investors. What we're seeing a lot of these community banks do when they invest directly into the companies is just take common stock with no rights, no board seat, no information. They don't even know how the company's doing because they're not getting quarterly. And also money. high valuations. And high valuations. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's on the one hand, it's really good that community banks are now interested and they're doing some of this. But on the other hand, what I would advise them, if they don't have somebody internal that does venture investing for a living, they should look, um, obviously this is, again, blowing my horn out a little bit, but they should look at a fund like ours, which can help them with the diversification, can help them get market valuations, if not better, and get them all the rights that early stage investors typically get when they invest in these companies. Which do you want to talk a little bit about just the market conditions? And oh, why we're yeah, excited? yeah. Maybe I'll just give a little bit of uh, some interesting things. So, you know, we, we talked about kind of all of the things that make us excited about this, the opportunity that we see, uh, why it's a here and now issue for community banks, um, why companies will find this fund attractive. But we haven't really talked about what's going on in the in the in the market itself. And so I just want to spend two seconds on that. So we are the companies that will invest in our SaaS companies or BAS companies. But if you use um, an index of SaaS valuations, we're at about seven year lows right now. And so um, so if we had started this fund two years ago, um, multiples of annual recurring revenue were in the high teens. And in some cases, you know, reaching 20, 20 times, right, which is kind of crazy. Um, we are super disciplined around valuation. So I don't know that we would have deployed any capital because we would have, but we would have felt pressure to, but we would probably wouldn't have because we'd be nervous about those valuations and the ability to grow into them. But now we're at like 7x. And so that's about a seven year low. And history has shown that when there's been periods of market dislocation and you and you have a fund that has a vintage right around that time and you're able to deploy capital, the returns you get are much, much greater on from an outsized perspective. Uh, you said there forward. goes buy low, sell high. That's awesome. Yes, exactly. That's yeah, pretty. Yeah. And, and we're at that cycle. And I think that's uh, I think that's exciting. So that's why we're, we're so excited. And and. It's important as it takes a little while for the it to work its way through the system where entrepreneurs have more realistic expectations, but we're seeing that now. And that's that's really good because now you're not having the difficult conversation of telling somebody why it's not a good thing for them to take money at that super high valuation because it, it's priced to perfection. There's no margin for error. And as we know, like uh, we've all looked at business plans of companies. I've never seen one that didn't have a hockey stick perfectly up and to the right, you know, uh, where everything's going to go perfect. And we all know that's not the way the world operates. And so when you're priced to perfection like that, there's a lot of pain on the way back down. And we've seen that with some of the mark to markets that other funds have had to do. Whereas now we're having more reasonable, we can have reasonable discussions about valuation uh, and there's there's margin for success, not margin for error. And I think that's really important. That was huge. Yep, I couldn't agree more. Yep, that was a mic drop. Uh, look, guys, <laughs> awesome. I want to give both of you guys just a quick moment, final thoughts, anything that you want. I always tell everybody, I just want to pick your brain, right? You guys are around the industry, good stewards of the industry, right? Taking care of community banks, talking to the the technology side, just whatever's on your mind and whatever you think. So take take a minute or so and give us final thoughts. What what I would <laughs> what 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 I would say, Tanner, is not just in this realm, but in other parts of my career through the years, what I have learned and now firmly believe and always solve for is the power of networks. When you get people together in a collaborative network way where they all are chipping in and helping, whether it's a not-for-profit organization, whether it's just a bunch of um, uh, smart companies, or if in our case, it's community banks, the power of the network is unfreaking believable. And it can really help you solve a lot of challenges that you cannot solve without that whole network. Um, I think technology, if you look at the internet, which has been one of the most profound technology changes in our life, you know, what is the internet? It's a network. You know, people forget that. It is just a network. And it had, has such a dramatic effect because it's a network. So the fact that this fund 
is affiliated with Bankers Helping Bankers. The fact that the two of you guys help help us with looking closely at technology companies and um, Dave, I'm, I'm not going to say how old you are, but man, you, you, you've you been around the block and you've seen a lot, which is a very positive thing because that way, when we look at a company, you give us a lot of great guidance because you've got that phenomenal knowledge over multiple decades. And having IBAT part of that, having CAMFIN part of that, having Wood Forest Bank part of that, it's just amazing it that we can we can look at things again using that 360 degree view so the power of the network is what really really you know if i'm having a rough day or if i'm thinking that something's not going right i'm like holy shit nobody's created what we've created and nobody's going to see the kinds of success we're going to see because of this network effect so for me that's the big uh, big thing great that's a tough act to follow that's like coming on after the bellamy brothers but i'll, I'll do my best <laughs> um so, um, yeah, I, I agree with what Niraj said. And I think the other thing that I've learned over my career, and I think we've, we've experienced it, and you, you guys kind of alluded to it, is what I call the spirit of generosity. And so by that, I mean, um, you know, we, we have never said no to a meeting. Um, Niraj and I worked together, and we were, we were kind of meeting with companies sometimes in their you know, dining room tables, uh, and they were early, early stage companies. But it always it always has um, a, a magical moment if you don't say no and you have a generosity of your time and spirit because you'll learn something always and uh, and you're you know to Niraj's point you're expanding your network and eventually um, these these points uh, come back to to together and form something and so I've always um, you know sometimes to 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 my, to, to my detriment have, have tried to be generous with my time and and we never we never say no to a meeting we never say no to a company. Um, and I've noticed that same spirit uh, amongst uh, you guys, amongst the IBAT folks, um, and and that to me, and and amongst the community bank executives that we meet with, and and I think that that to me, um, you know, is is really a critical uh, and important thing. And I I, uh, I try to teach my, you know, my, I'd like to, my kids to know that too. Like you know, just don't 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 ever don't ever say no. Always be generous with your with your time and 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 uh, and be open minded. So I'd, I'd add that. I tell you what, guys, with, with bankers helping bankers and the entire ecosystem of all the things that we put together there, including the BHB fund, th this is a moment. It's a movement. Uh, and it, it, this is your opportunity, banks, uh, and, and other people that want to invest, fine. But I'm going to tell you right. This is the moment where banks will decide their future. And it will either be what everybody tells you it is. There's no way to win. We're all going to go away to Buffalo. Or... It's going to be the time that we all put our money together. We all put our resources together. We got a lot of smart people together and we found our way through this thing. And I'm going to tell you straight up, I talk to companies every day, just like you guys. I talk to bankers every single day. I probably had five calls all this morning already with different bankers. There is a spirit right now of success and an opera, you know, uh, in collaboration. Yes. And everybody gets it. Yep. And, and we're showing people the way this company here, look at this company there. We do it every week. And, we, we have an opportunity to win. Uh, and, and I don't think this window will exist years from now. This is the moment in time to act. It really is. I agree. Totally agree. Yeah. I, look, I got to tell you guys, I appreciate everything that you're doing, right? I do too. I mean, you you brought us all together, right? And some of us were, you know, us and I bet we're doing things before and bankers helping bankers. And you guys bring in all sorts of other folks, right? And expanding the network, right? And uh, it's really cool to watch the overlap and all the collaboration. And I think we're all like forming new friendships with other new people yeah. and we're all enjoying it. So we're watching the team come it's, together it's and, how it it's so neat. and and yeah. the, the amount fun. of work that you guys do is overwhelming. And I mean, appreciated. Very much appreciated by every yep. banker out there. Yeah, to his point of what the, the future looks like and how we all need to band together. You guys are, are cranking out the time and the effort and the hours. And look, I know that in the, the grand scheme of things, I think, the technology companies win off your efforts. The community banks win. Some of us investors probably win, but I don't think that this is a big personal financial victory for you guys, certainly not with the effort you put in. So we appreciate that. Thank you guys. It's 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 been fun riding with the FinTech Cowboys so far and look forward to a long ride ahead together. So You bet. We'll see you guys next time. All right. Thank Bye you guys. guys.